Hello, this is Candidate Conversations. I'm Nick Gibson, a local government reporter at the Spokesman Review, and I'm here with uh, Representative Leonard Christian, a Republican candidate for Washington's 4th Legislative District. Uh, he's seeking a state Senate seat. Welcome, Leonard. Well, thank you for having me, Nick. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for being here. Uh, to start, we wanted to give you the opportunity to make your pitch to the voters. Uh, why should they cast their vote for you this November? Well, I appreciate that, uh, Nick. Uh, just let the voters know that uh, I've been a hard worker. When uh, when they came around uh, two years ago to run for office, I made a few promises that I'd work hard for my community and work hard for lower taxes, and I kept that promise. Uh, you can you know, encourage the voters to go back and check on my uh, voting record. I care much about my community. Uh, I've gotten really involved in the schools uh, system because about half of every dollar that uh, is collected in the state goes somewhere to public education. And so I got involved in the school system uh, because that's important. I met with all of these superintendents and still uh, have a good working relationship with them because uh, reality is uh, those children are going to be our future. So uh, it wasn't something I was thinking about when I got into the legislature, but uh, it seemed to have gotten a hold of me. Uh, and and, and uh, care about the kids in our community, and I care about the you know uh, that's 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 the next future. It's the next generation. So, I uh, hope to go back in the Senate and do the exact same thing, and work hard again for the community, and continue to work on uh, you know, lower taxes. And uh, I know crime in our district is a little lower than the Spokane uh, City core, um, but that's because we're working really hard with our uh, city leaders to make sure that that crime uh, rate is is lower, and we have the officers to take care of it. Thank you. And we're hoping to dive into some of those issues a little more. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we get there, I just wanted to backtrack to the primary a little bit. Yeah. Um, you made it out of a crowded field of candidates. You uh, notably did not receive the county Republican Party's endorsement. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious if you feel you've garnered their support now and the support of their voters. Uh, boy, you're like kicking a hornet's nest here, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, if you got to the fair today, you'll notice that there's the candidates and then there's the GOP fair booth. So uh, they're two separate booths in two different buildings. So uh, <clears throat> there's a reason for that. Uh, the, the current GOP leadership is, is uh, in, in my personal opinion, has gone uh, to support a lot of the far right candidates who uh, it's like Bird, uh, you know, uh, Danzel and a few others that. Uh, but the challenge is if you're you're a, a candidate and you don't support what the people they want, they treat you poorly. Um, and so we have several candidates who came out right away and supported Dave Reichard, feeling that he had a better shot at making it through. And, and uh, myself, I had an issue with Bird because of his military um, issues while he was in the service. And uh, I think military people expect a little bit more out of military people. So uh, when I started reading about what he had done in, in the military, it was, for me, it was game over. He's not going to get my support. Well, that made the leaders of the Republican Party pretty unhappy. Uh, so uh, they they didn't endorse me. They went after somebody else, uh, and and uh, and uh, they came around actually after the primary and the win. And they did ask if I was interested in their endorsement. And I let them know that I, I probably was, and I was doing better without it. Hey, well, thank you for touching on that. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, I guess yeah. We'll we'll turn to the issues now. What sure. do you kind of see as the top issues facing the district, <coughs> and what are your plans to address some of those? Well, I know for us is, uh, you know, gas taxes, as, as a, you know, taxes and, and the money that, um, so I was in office in 2014 and uh, uh, the same job as a representative and as an appointed representative, and the budget is doubled since 2014. And I know that my paycheck surely has doubled since 2014, and probably most of the listeners or uh, the folks, your readers as well, have not had that kind of an increase, uh, but yet... Going back this year, we're looking at raising more taxes. Uh, so we've got to figure out a way to, to not be that burden on, on our, our folks. Uh, you know, the, the Carbon Commitment Act, you know, I, I, I care about the planet. I care about making sure the next generation has a, a, a you know, clean water and a clean air. Um, but that's, you got to come to reality. You, you can't have battery-operated ferry boats, you know, driven by unicorns. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to work within the technology that we actually have, and we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on hoping that we can get to battery um, ferry boats while the system's currently failing and is costing us a lot of money. 
Uh, and so we need to get in there now. We even brought a bill forward uh, this last session that says we start building ferry boats now that are uh, diesel uh, hybrid, so they're electric hybrids, so that later if the technology comes along for batteries, we can convert hybrid. Clean, but yet solving the problem that we have. So, uh, it, of course, when that, that whole carbon came around, everyone kept saying, oh, it's only going to cost a few pennies. Well, yeah, it's been a lot more than a few pennies, uh, unless you can probably live in my district because you go to Idaho to fill up. <laughs> so maybe it doesn't affect you as much uh, to the people in my district. But for most of the people in this state, uh, they're paying 50, 60 cents more a gallon of gas for, you know, uh, battery school buses, battery ferries, you know, things that... Uh, that are not proven technology quite yet. So it sounds like you would be supportive of Initiative 2117. Yes. Uh, yeah. Kind of takes aim at the Climate Commitment Act. Yeah. I, in fact, I'd be very supportive of all the initiatives, to be honest with you. Okay. So, uh, you know, in a, uh, even the one with, uh, and it's dealing with, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's an income tax. The problem with the government is once we get the, our nose under the tent, uh, the tent comes ripping down pretty quick. And uh, it made it pretty clear that um, you know, it, it went to court. Um, uh, and in, it was it, even the IRS calls uh, capital gains tax a tax on your income. Uh, but yet Supreme Court here decided it wasn't. Uh, so in reality is I think the voters need to make it clear that Washington State has not had an income tax and they don't want one. And so, and the capital gains is, I mean, granted, there could be some um, you know, repercussions in some of our school budgets, but that's, uh, we have the money to do it in this state. We need to stop focusing on social programs and start focusing on the next generation. Yeah. Well, you've touched on education uh, when mm -hmm. we started today, and you just did again. Uh, one of the issues we're seeing kind of in the Spokane, Spokane Valley area is a lot of districts uh, did not have their measures passed in the most recent special election. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're worried about uh, future budgeting. Is there anything at the state level that you would do to kind of alleviate some of those funding woes? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question because uh, you're right. You've got to pay for it, and where's the money coming from? And uh, the Blake decision may come back around uh, to get us again because uh, we're not fully funding education uh, according to what, what I believe the interpretation was of uh, the you know, Supreme Court. But when you talk about what uh, you know, the funding wells, you know, we still we still have a lot of trust land that can be used to generate more income, even though our state does a little bit better than, than many states to, to give them credit for that. Uh, but there's also, uh, we're also dealing with you know, things like we have a cap on special education. And so I actually was a, um, a supporter on a bill, in fact, second person to sign on to a bill that would have removed the cap on special education funding. Because if you have a um, you know, everyone's entitled to an education, but if you have a special needs child that has to have special uh, transportation to the school and from the school and uh, nursed from the moment they get picked up to the moment that they are you know, brought home, uh, that gets expensive. And that's not all covered by the state. Uh, in fact, there's a cap on that. So we need to relook at that cap being removed uh, so that the state uh, takes its responsibility for paying for special education, for helping their paraeducators. And the paraeducators are, are not paid that well uh, for, the, for the job they do. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we've, we've ran some bills uh, helping paraeducators to get more of them on board uh, to come and help. Because in the classroom, uh, the teachers have a hard time teaching when they're dealing with so many um, health and, um, and special needs. And, and, and honestly, some of the mental health issues that are going on in the classroom uh, where, where we have need pair educators to come along and be able to be uh, there to, to be a force multiplier for the teachers. Yeah, that's part of that education system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very complex. And like I said at the beginning, you know, uh, almost half of every single dollar collected in taxes go to some public education somehow. If our states, it's, you know, the uh, residents of Washington State have deemed it to be very important. Well, while we're talking about kind of funding sources, mm -hmm. you know, at the local level, it's usually uh, an ask to increase property taxes. Yep. Um, one of the things that was floated in, in recent sessions uh, was uh, kind of raising the cap on how much local jurisdictions mm -hmm. can raise property taxes without going to the voters. I know many cities and counties across the state want to see that increase from 1% per year to 3% per year. Yep. Are you supportive <clears throat> of that effort? I voted no. 
Oh. So uh, yeah, why not? Well, because uh, as a lot of things that we do, we have initiatives, and uh, the voters are speaking. And when the voters are speaking, and and, and why I didn't want that cap to, to go through was I do believe it is important that um, we ask the voters for more money. If if uh, if we're going to go um, and and spend more money or demand more money of you, uh, I think the voters have the right. And you saw the school levies fail. Well, and you also saw the jail levy fail. In in Honestly, that's because I believe we did a poor job of telling the, the voters where that money's going to go. We had a few years ago, we had a, a parks um, uh, tax come along, and we got told that we were going to have all of these improvements to Riverfront Park um, with that money. And and uh, we didn't get what we thought we were going to get for that money. So if you were to tell the you know as us as leaders, we need to be very clear on where that money is going to be spent and be held accountable to where that money is going to be spent. And I think that's some of the what's what's causing some of these things to fail is not a clear message of where that money is going to be spent. Uh, I know just on the west side of the state they were able to pass a public safety uh, uh, tax increase. Uh, and it was strictly because they they did a very good job. The leaders came together. They had the support of all the leaders, not just, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans, but all of them. But they made it really clear that we're going to be responsible. We're going to collect this money in the beginning. Uh, we'll be saving a little bit for the first two years so that we're able to get a bond and that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's like putting money down on the house. Your interest rate's going to be a lot less if you have some money to put down on the house. Uh, they were going to put some down. They were very specific where that money was going to go, and then s- a certain amount was going back to the cities, and a certain amount was going to uh, hire more law enforcement and then to jail. And that passed overwhelmingly. I think, again, it comes back to the voters are, just, are not going to just say no to all taxes. We all know we want good, you know, good fire, we want good police, we want good roads, good schools, and we know that it's expensive. What I think the voters get really upset about is, is you not... Uh, telling them what you're going to spend the money on, and then when you do get it, you spend it on something else. So I think uh, if the voters made it clear that they wanted that 1%, I'm not going to go against them, the voters. Well, I know uh, public safety is a big part Mm -hmm. of your campaign, um, and it's kind of front of mind for voters in the 4th District right now. Spokane Valley is looking to hire more police officers. Um, In Spokane County, you know, the court system and the jails are are somewhat overwhelmed as are prosecutors and public defenders. Um, I'm curious, what at the state level can you do for public safety? Well, that's a very good question. Um, (laughs) Being on the minority side, you can't do a whole lot other than to work with the majority side uh, and help uh, explain the problem. I know there's been some um, some unique ideas that have done really well. Uh, the tribes, actually, on the other side of the state have a, a prison, a jail system that uh, the different counties are now bringing inmates to when they're running out of room. And it's working out really well for both the tribe and, in fact, uh, the people in the, the area uh, because they have a jail bed. Our problem here is we have a red light that says you can't bring anyone else here until we let somebody else out uh, because there's just no more jail space available. That shouldn't be. Uh, we sh- when somebody breaks the law, they need to be held accountable, and we got to have a bed uh, available for them to be accountable. Uh, I was in the Air Force. I t- you know, like I told you, you know, or the voters probably know that I was in the Air Force for 21 years. You know, we had nuclear weapons. Nobody, nobody wants us to use nuclear weapons. But you know what? It's the threat that we have them that keeps the world in, in, in check. And I think the jail is the same thing. I think I'd love to have a really nice jail. <laughs> and never have to use it. But if you have to use it, it needs to be there. And so it's kind of like carrying the big stick and, uh, you know, you'd rather hope never to have to swing it, but the same token, you got to have it. And I think in this case, us not having jail beds available, and that it just encourages the criminals knowing they're going to be let out right away, catch and release. Um, it doesn't give them any reason to stop being a criminal knowing that they're not going to really have any repercussions for that. So I think we need to rethink both the majority and the minority side of the aisle and start saying, how do we hold people accountable so that we don't have these issues? Because really, there's only about 100 people in Spokane County that are really causing these problems, but they keep getting let back out to cause the problems. When are we going to stop them? So would you uh, be supportive of, of kind of increased penalties? And then um, as far as, you know, policing, something that often gets cited to us as reporters is, you know, Washington State is at the lower end of uh, officers per capita. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, dead last. Would you be 
supportive of ad- allocating more funding towards those efforts? Well, yes, um, I would be putting more money towards it. But having you can have all the law enforcement officers in the world without the ability to uh, hold somebody the criminal accountable, it doesn't do you any good. And I think that's one of our problems uh, with our, our current uh, leadership for the state is that uh, the officers have not been respected when you literally, they do their job, uh, which many times, you know, you're doing it up anymore. On the cell phone and putting it up on Facebook and um it makes it very difficult for a police officer to do their job. And then when you finally get the job done, you finally catch the bad guy, you have everything you need, you haul into the jail, they're walking out the front door of the jail before the officer even completes their paperwork. Do you know how disheartening that is? That is amazing. I mean, why, you just got to ask yourself, why am I doing this job if they're out the door before I finish my paperwork? It's harder on the officers to finish their paperwork than it is for the criminal. So we've got to get that changed in our state. Well, thank you. I appreciate you touching on that. Um, so you worked in real estate yes. for many years. Yes. Uh, so I want to touch on housing with you. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, what do you kind of see as uh, the biggest challenges when it comes to housing? Obviously, you know, 31,000 uh, around that were homeless at one point or another last year mm-hmm. here in the state of Washington. Um and we also have a pretty low housing stock right now. Yeah. Uh, so with your kind of lived experience, what's your perspective on kind of the next steps the state should be taking? I mean, that's a really good one. I appreciate you asking that. <laughs> and the housing issue in, in, in our state is not just um, investment or, you know, lack of being able to build. A lot of it comes down to regulations and then cost of building. You know, it costs more to build because of the regulations in Washington State than it does just across the border in Idaho. And so as, as houses get more expensive because uh, some studies have said it's 40000 more to build an average home in Washington just to pay for the regulations. Um, and, and I've seen that. I've, done, I've worked with, with folks due to developments. We were paying for a roundabout, um, what they call an impact fee. Uh, So we're we're trying to divide the land up and build new houses on this acreage. And you're paying an impact fee for a roundabout uh, that someday may be built. Uh, It wasn't built at the time, and it wasn't projected to be built at the time. But you're paying this money because it's going to be projected in the future. And that the people in this house probably would never drive that way. Uh, But yet they were paying for these impact fees. They pay for um, impacts to schools and the sewer systems. And so when you start adding all these impact fees together, the builder has to pay them in advance and then pass that cost on to the home buyer. So it gets more expensive for folks to buy a house uh, in our state. permits to do things. And so where, you know, you go to uh, directly to Idaho, I hate to say it, but uh, you can get a permit done to do a subdivision or start building a house months quicker than you can in Washington state. I will say this uh, city of Spokane Valley has done a phenomenal job of streamlining that process. And so as a realtor, people would rather want to build in Spokane Valley or even in the county over the city of Spokane, and, and you guys uh, may have re- remembered an article that just happened a couple of years ago where they raised all of the fees uh, to build the house, so to hook up to the sewer, to hook up to the water. Um, and uh, those, those fees, again, uh, make it more expensive for the average person to buy a house. And then, of course, as a builder, you're not going to build a house unless you can sell it for profit, and they're not in it for charity. <laughs> a lot more things you could do in life than, you know, uh, for charity than to build houses for people that, you know, at a loss. It's just not going to do it. There's got to be a profit in it for them. And so uh, when you start, you know, adding these fees, the price goes up. At some point, the buyer says, I can't afford that. So then the house, they just don't build the houses at that point. So... So Initiative uh, 2066, uh, that's coming up on the ballot this November, uh, and it's kind of in line with housing. It would uh, kind of, it would enshrine natural gas usage in mm-hmm. the state. Yeah. Um, do you consider, you know, it's taken aim at some of the recent updates to the state building code, you know, that prioritize yeah. things like heat pumps and, and more 
uh, energy efficient, you know, electrical appliances. Do you view those as some of those cumbersome requirements for building? You know, it's it's kind of funny because not probably five years ago, uh, we were getting all these rebates to please convert from electricity to natural gas. And then we get getting told, you've got to, you know, you've got to convert your house to clean natural gas. It's saving energy. You know, what happened to the science between five years ago and today that all of a sudden, you know, natural gas is horrible and it's, it's a, you know, it's a bad situation. Well, I'll tell you what it was. You got Seattle over there and their P&G is, is uh, losing money on their national gas. And so they decided to run a bill to just say, tell the people of our state that you can't use natural gas. Why? Uh, it's not because it doesn't heat your home nicely and, and warm and cook your food. No, it's because we're losing money. So we want everyone to convert to electricity. So they've been pushing, uh, you know, their narrative that uh, that natural gas is bad. Uh, no, natural gas is, is clean. And, uh, and, and I spoke to a, an energy uh, I'm not going to main, name the company here, but I said, what do you, what's your takes on this? And they go, doesn't matter to us. We're just going to burn more natural gas to make electricity and sell electricity. We don't care. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're not saving the environment by, uh, by forcing that. And then, of course, then people want to take the dams out as well. But uh, there, as far as moving into the heat pumps, and I did install a heat pump in my motorhome, actually, because it does work well just over the propane that we had to buy constantly. And, and when I uh, live in Olympia during session, the heat pump pretty much heats the motorhome the whole time. Although we did have some days when it was freezing, and guess what? I had to turn on my propane uh, because there was not enough heat from the heat pump to keep keep up. And we have the same thing over here. You know, the west side of the state, it doesn't get that cold, but we get a lot of freezing temperatures, and the heat pumps don't have the ability um, to produce enough heat to, to heat the home. Um and then, of course, the other side of that coin is, is uh, the folks in, in, uh, on the other side of the state. You know, you've got builders plan years in advance for neighborhoods, you know, the infrastructure, the sewer, the water, the, the electricity. Well, now they came in with this bill that says you've got to use, um, you know, electricity to heat your home instead of natural gas. Well, that whole neighborhood infrastructure was designed for heating the homes with, with gas. So there's not enough electricity so guess what? And they've got to go back in, tear up the roads, tear up the lawns, before they can even build a house, invest millions more uh, to put upgraded electricity because they're not allowed to build now a house that uses the gas that that neighborhood was planned for. It's foolishness. Um, when, when, when somebody plans on something, they know a builder plans on a neighborhood and invests and does all the research and speaks to all of the county leaders and state leaders and, and goes out and spends their money and, and wants to build a community. And then all of a sudden, they change the rules and make them lose money. How fair is that? Well, thank you. I know I, I had just recently covered Initiative 2066, so mm -hmm. I've heard uh, thoughts on both sides of that, that issue. Um, do you have any concern, if the initiative does pass, do you have any concern uh, about the state's efforts to try to address climate change on how that might impact it? I, I personally don't have concerns about it because um, I don't. I really don't. I think people will, um, will convert over as the technology and the prices are there. Um, but when you get in like up in my district, up in Elk, you know, I have, have some remote folks up there, they lose their power during the winter. You know, a tree falls and a windstorm comes along, knocks a tree down. And if your only source of heating is, is electricity, you're going to be having busted pipes and, and it's going to be a very expensive, um, you know, adventure for you. And so a lot of those folks up there choose to heat by either wood or, or, um, or you know, propane because uh, natural gas isn't around up there, but that's their heat source. And it's not the cheapest and, uh, you know, to do, and it's not the most convenient by any means, but it's kind of a necessity uh, because the, re the power company is not as reliable because of the storms in the tree. When you get into a more, you know, urban area, you know, such as in Spokane, Spokane Valley, um, you know, people are going to change out their, their heating systems, and if uh, Vista's offering a nice rebate on, on changing into a heat pump, They'll go that route because they'll save money in the long run. And I think that we should be doing it with a carrot and not a stick. So maybe offering more people the opportunity like they did when they were trying to get them all to switch to gas. 
here's the opportunities. Your furnace needs replacement. You can save money. You can help the environment. Because I don't th- think anyone out there just wants to destroy the environment. I mean, you talk to anybody in, in our in our lovely state. We have a beautiful state, beautiful lakes, beautiful trees. Nobody wants to say, oh, hey, let's destroy the environment. It's not. They want to do it. They want to do the right thing. It's just, is it? can they do it? Um, at 50 cents a gallon more, it's, it starts, you know, and then uh, it pans down into utility bills and food and everything else and our inflation in our state. At some point, you just can't do it. You have to ask today, can I save the environment today? Nope. Uh, I'll do it tomorrow when I can afford it. Well, thank you for that perspective. I, I kind of want to stick with um, some past housing legislation sure. that didn't quite make it through. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, annual rent cap inc- or yep. annual rent increase caps have mm-hmm. been considered for a couple of years now. I think recently uh, the number was floating around 7%. Yeah. Would you be in favor of a cap there? Why or why not? And when I was pretty clear, I do not favor a rent cap system whatsoever. Um, and, and that's a very good question. And I'm happy to answer why. Uh, because it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just clear as day. Uh, if you were, you know, for the landlord, you're capping what they could raise the rent, but there's no cap on how much property taxes. Your earlier question was, can we raise the property taxes to 3% uh, without voter approval? Well, if they're having to pay more for property taxes or more levies, fire districts, whatever, and then maintenance and, of course, insurance is going up significantly, you're quickly going to run out of the ability for that landlord to make money if you've capped them. And plus, at that point, they're going to pass along the maximum they can, that they have to do every year because that's all they're going to be able to do. So they're going to pass that on as a maximum so you can count on, and say, 7% raise in your um, rent every year. Where there's landlords out there who have, I'm, I'm a realtor. I've seen these uh, rolls, rent rolls, and I'm going, how come you haven't raised your rent in five years? Well, I got these, you know, older tenants, and I, I paid for the place, and we basically don't need the money extra, so I just do it out of the goodness of my heart. Those days will be gone. You know, and so you'll see more of the older folks where your landlord is having compassion. They won't be able to afford to have compassion on them. So if you're able to fix all of the cost and guarantee the landlord a certain, you know, amount of money, uh, profit every year for, for being a landlord, I'd consider it. But then since that's not happening, I'm absolutely not going to do it. And then what happened is they tried this in Portland and it did not work. You're going to get uh, the big investors who build the apartment buildings, who add a lot of, um, you know, senior housing or low-income housing or uh, even, you know, the new generation wanting to come out and leave mom and dad's house. Well, your first house will probably be an apartment. They're not going to come into our state and build knowing that they're uh, in a situation where they're limited on, on, on what they could do. So it sounds like you think, uh, particularly for your district, that a lot of that business would end up going across the border to Idaho. It still has. Yes. Um, <laughs> they, if you haven't gone and cut an exit one in Idaho, uh, what's a Maverick doing? Putting in more gas pumps. Now there's a new Circle K. Uh, Got to tell you, I drove straight from Olympia, straight to the Maverick to fill up my motor months, 100 gallons of ga- uh, diesel. Why would I fill that up in Washington State? Doesn't make any sense. Drove it straight uh, home from uh, my uh, after session, right over there and filled the tank. Uh, it was ab- absolutely worth it at that point. Saved me over 60 bucks. Well, I, um, you mentioned it kind of earlier in our conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the legislature tends to skew heavily to the Democrats. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do you operate within, you know, that kind of environment? And how can you be an effective senator if elected? Yeah, that, that's a, another really good question. So um, in it, with, with when you're in the minority, I mean, it's like you, you have to be on defense. And so uh, I wish it was more that we were trying to bring really good ideas forward. Um in, but being in the minority party, you, your ideas uh, many times don't make it through. So the best thing you can do is, as I did on, on one of my bills uh, earlier, uh, wanted to remove that uh, cap on special education funding. Well, a Democrat um, brought forward a bill as I'm re- reading these bills. Uh, and it's like exactly what I wanted to do it was my idea. Uh, but he brought it forward. So I signed on as number two. And he calls me up. He goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm going exactly what, I, what my uh, superintendents asked me to, to, to support. And so I, I, you know, happy to sign on to your bill. So you'll find if you really have a good idea, uh, the best thing to do in Olympia is, is convince somebody who's in the majority party um, that it is a good idea, explain to them why, and then um, work with them to either, you know, run it or be a, a co-sponsor on your bill. And that's how you end up working together. 
the other thing you end up doing is you're on defense. Uh, so when you see something that's really bad, you uh, you work against it. You put amendments on it. You try to make the bill better. There was a bill that uh, wanted to give all uh, veterans um, free camping in state parks. Well, I mean, it sounds really great, but it, that's, it, there was no limits on it. So the dishonorable discharged veterans, I mean, the... <laughs> Uh, you know, the people who only made it in a few days because they, they were so egregious, they got thrown out of the military. And so I brought forward an amendment that says, you know, I'm, and I'm not real thrilled with that because our park system needs need the money. But if you want to give, you know, free camping and everything to everybody, which is great. I mean, I'm a veteran. I, I, I get free camping. I'm a disabled veteran. Um, but don't give it to the people who dishonored and disgraced America. And they took that amendment. So in as us on the minority side, we have to do a little more work to help them understand on the majority side maybe why that bill isn't such a good idea. You know, why it isn't such a good idea to throw people in jail for a year for mowing the grass with a gas-powered mower, which was a bill last year, instead of using an electric one. So it's like you're, you're going to have to throw a murderer out of jail so you can put somebody who mowed their grass with a gas-powered mower in jail. Uh, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so some of these things, they, uh, they don't think them all through. So, you know, we had one bill in my committee uh, last year that would have given felons, incarcerated felons, serving their time, the right to vote. Well, they didn't think that through because what is um, the requirement to vote? Uh, you know, be a resident in the, in the state. Well, what's the requirement for um, jury duty? Registered voter. So these people in jail felons, murderers, whatever, in jail, serving their time, could be, you know, called for jury duty. What's the requirement for run for office? Registered voter. So not only would these folks in jail be able to serve on jury duty, they would have been able to run for office. And if you get to small areas, uh, you know, uh, out here, Carnell, Carnell, uh, there's more inmates than there are citizens. So if they got together and says, we're going to choose some inmates to be our representatives, guess what? Now we got prisoners being representatives in Olympia for them and while they're serving their time. And guess what? You can't stop them from going to Olympia and serving, doing their job. Once you're a representative, you can't be stopped from going and doing your job, even though you're serving your time in felony. So they didn't think the bill through very well. So we had to point that out, and eventually they, they backed on, off on the bill. So that's how you're effective in Olympia and when you're in the minority. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I um, only have a couple more questions for you. Sure. I wanna... I'm having fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, yeah. I appreciate your time today. Uh, you, you pointed to a couple examples there. Uh, could you point out a couple more for the voters of, of kind of your work in Olympia that you've been proud of? Yeah, so some of the things I've been kind of most proud of is, is um, you know, working to some on capital budgets, and not only in state government, but one of my in this capital budget. And so I, I went into that um, with a different outlook than some of my, my predecessors. And, and I think that uh, I went there with the mindset of I want to go and get every dollar I can to come back to my district. We're paying for it. Um, that money's being collected. I want to make sure that, that I work to fight hard to get everything back to our district. So uh, some of the projects that I fought hard for was a, sen a senior housing, get a million dollars for senior housing, uh, get some money for a, a, a preschool. The, the state came in and, and made them remove all of their equipment, uh, play yard equipment, because it didn't meet current standards. So the kids had nowhere to go except an empty um, fenced-in area. And so I worked to get some money for that, that uh, uh, you know, re equipment to be replaced in my district. Uh, went on to get some money for uh, Kaiser, uh, and everyone, you know, it's controversial. You know, why'd you work to get money for Kaiser? Well, they got 1,100 good-paying jobs in my district. Why would I want them guys to uh, not succeed? You know, uh, so have a little bit different mindset. I want to do things that are good for the people in my district. You know, work hard. I'd like to see East Valley get new school buildings built. I know they have some challenges because of the urban growth area and their tax base. Uh, those are really complex issues that working through with my counterparts in Olympia and the, the leaders here locally, because you know those students who uh, you know go to go to East Valley, they go to Liberty Lake and they see the brand new Ridge Line building. It was just beautiful school building. And I'm glad Ridge Line's there, but then they have to go back to their old you know built in the 50s building. It's not fair to them. You know they live they don't live that far apart. They deserve a, a new school building as well. So. Uh, so some of those are the ones that I'm working on. Um, uh, and other than that, uh, I'd like to get involved in transportation, to be honest with you, in the Senate. Uh, but maybe not for the same idea. My, a lot of people understand uh, my background is all aviation. 
and while roads are important, and we fought really hard when, when Governor Inslee announced he was going to um, put off the funding for six years on the North-South Freeway, and we came together and fought for that. But my passion is, is there's a lot of money available for airport improvement throughout our state, and I think we're missing the boat and not taking advantage of that from the federal government. Some of these projects will be paid 90% by the federal government for some of these airport improvement projects. And I will say locally here, we've got some amazing leaders who have uh, done well taking advantage of that to improve Spokane International and Feltz Field. But there's some leaders who have not gotten the, the sight of an understanding of um, of that, and the runways are, are disintegrating. And I think we need, uh, there's just not somebody in Olympia who understands the aviation side of the world. Are there any other uh, kind of committees or appointments you'd be interested in if elected? Yeah, at, at the moment, uh, I'm, look, I, I'm, I'm asking anyway for to, to be on uh, tra- transportation would be nice. I'd love to be in energy, but uh, I know that's a tough one to get into as well. Um, <clears throat> I know there's a need. Uh, I've been on state government my entire um, career, so uh, one year in 2014, and then again, the last two years I've been on state government. So uh, even though it's not something I'm am I passionate about, something I'm very knowledgeable about, and um, and I work, uh, I actually have breakfast from time to time with our, our county auditor here, which is the Democrat, to just find out what the issues are. Where, where does she see these uh, issues for voting in elections? Because um, elections have to be, um, you know, considered safe, or you have a society that breaks down. And so it's very important that you work with across the aisle, to make sure that the, the, all the voters in your society can feel safe that their vote counted um, because there's a lot of people who don't vote because they feel like their vote doesn't matter or it doesn't count. I can assure you it does get counted. Uh, they, they work hard um, to make sure the votes are accurate and counted. Is there problems? Yeah. The folks who decide to throw their mail, uh, their vote ballot in the, in the local mailbox the last day, um, you know, guess what? It may not get picked up that day or may not uh, be processed that day. Uh, so their election ballot is, is stamped the next day. Well, guess what? It doesn't count. Uh, it just, uh, it's too late. You have to make sure your ballot is in before 8 p.m. postmark that day. Uh, and so there's some issues that we need to work through and even, even some issues with the post office. Uh, and those are some of the ones I'm working on. So as far as committees go, um, I'm even uh, enjoying health care issues that I've been getting involved in. And, and, of course, a lot of people would like me to be on education, I'm kind of running, but uh, I'm probably going to get pulled, and <laughs> handcuffed, and thrown into a chair and, and work on education. Again, not because it's my passion, but because it's important to my community and I'm willing to, to do what's important to my community. Well, is there anything else that we haven't touched on today that you wanted to share with voters? Uh, any issues that you'd hope to focus on or yeah, a last-minute pitch? No, uh, I think uh, I appreciate that, by the way. Uh, um, veterans' issues are, are really... We're seeing less and less people in, involved in uh, the legislature that have had a military service background. Uh, and so I, and it, I'm, I'm probably focusing on some of that stuff as well just because uh, we need more people... Um, in the legislature, understand veterans' issues. When when a veteran comes here, guess what? They don't just bring the veteran. Most of the time, they bring a you know a wife or, or you know spouse and, and children along, and those are going to be in our community, in our schools. And we need to make sure we've been doing a great job of helping the spouse be able to bring their their license. So say if they're a nurse and they move, you know, it's not their choice to maybe to move to uh, Spokane, but the wife now can't work, and she may have made more money than the than the husband, or or and vice versa, uh, you know, uh, spouse either way. Uh, so we have to work to make sure those issues are there for veterans. Uh, when we had the assault rifle ban, uh, they didn't care about veterans on that one at all. I, I tried to explain to them, you've got people. You're going to do this with an emergency you know, uh, enactment in July, so it takes place right away. We have people that are in route. Their orders brought them here to Fairchild or, or you know, uh, Fort Lewis. Their belongings, their weapons are in containers. They're not in where they can touch them. The moving company has them. Guess what? When this bill comes into play, if you don't make an exemption for those folks in that situation, they become criminals the minute the furniture is unloaded on, you know, at their, at their apartment or, or home or you know, on base. And they're like, we don't care. We don't care. It's like, how can you not care about your veterans? And how can you not care about the whole career? That, and they, they've done nothing wrong. They, they were coming here. They had the weapons. They owned the weapons. They legally could have them. The law changed, and, and we didn't care to, to exempt them out. That those folks that have done nothing wrong and, and make them a criminal. 
So it's when we do bills like that that we 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 don't stop and think the entire bill through or what the impact is on on our veterans community. Uh, we need people who are going to stand up and tell them, uh, and then fight for those those folks. Luckily, we we were in a better situation with that, but uh, that very well could happen. And interestingly enough, you and uh, your opponent in this race are, are both veterans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's been very respectful and very polite and uh, seems like a very nice gentleman. So, yeah. Well, any uh, final words before we wrap up here today? I just uh, My final word is, is, is we have a very important election coming up, and I just really want to encourage people to, to do their homework and vote. Um, your, your vote does matter. It is super important. And if you ever have, uh, you know, concerns with me, I answer emails all the time or uh, phone calls. Uh, anyone can Google my phone number and believe me, it pops up. I'm a realtor. It pops up. And that's my direct cell phone line. Happy to have coffee. Um, kind of talk about uh, not everybody appreciates me, uh, you know, because I'm willing. Uh, I was not raised rich. I was very poor. I've been homeless before with my family, uh, you know, as, as growing up as, uh, as a child. Single mom on welfare. So, uh, but you know what? I'm willing to listen to anybody out there who wants to call and talk to me and, and uh, ask why I voted a certain way or, or why I should support something different. And I love to learn. So, you know, out there, so please reach out. And I think you'll find that to be true with uh, most of the legislators. Don't be afraid of us. Uh, we're not some great, you know, Pooh Baba on the Oz Curtain kind of thing. Uh, we're just normal people that have stepped up to do a job, and we need your input and your, so don't be afraid to reach out and talk to your representatives. Well, thank you for taking the time today. I greatly appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, Nick.